Good evening, everyone, or should I probably say good <laughs> afternoon. <coughs> Welcome to the Tempe City Council work study session. Item number one, that's call to order. Next thing is call to the audience. The City Council welcomes public comment at this time for the issue review session and committee of the whole items on this work study session agenda. There is a three minute time limit per speaker. Uh, Madam Clerk, I think we have one card this evening, I believe. Yes, Mr. Mayor, but that's um, provided as part of the meeting record for your review. Okay, so not here in per. Okay, great. I will, though, look to the audience. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the City Council? If so, please get my attention. Okay, seeing none, I will move on. I'm going to move some things around based on my agenda. We've got a couple of things. We have a Pride Month proclamation and a uh, appreciation for our General Plan 2050 working group. So I'm going to go do those first. If people from council would like to join me down in the front. All right, first up here, we have a proclamation for Pride Month, and that proclamation reads, whereas the city of Tempe is deeply committed to equality for all, and whereas the LGBTQ plus community has fought tirelessly for equality and the rights and protections they deserve at home, at work, and in the public. And whereas the fight for LGBTQ plus equality continues across Arizona, the United States, and the entire world, and the city of Tempe is a committed partner in this effort. And whereas in 2014, the Tempe City Council established protections for LGBTQ plus individuals from discrimination at home, work, and in public spaces, which were then enshrined by voters in 2015 in the city charter by an overwhelming majority. Since the passage of these protections, the city of Tempe has earned a perfect score on the Human Rights Campaign's Municipal Equality Index. And whereas the city of Tempe has an LGBTQ plus alliance called Tempe Pride and celebrates the great diversity of our employees, including those identifying as LGBTQ plus, and joins them in celebrating pride for who they are. And whereas Tempe will proudly participate in pride events throughout the region with dignitaries, public safety officials, and city employees all unified to support the LGBTQ plus community as they remember their history and commit to continuing the work towards true equality for all people, no matter who they are or who they love. And whereas the city of Tempe is proud to celebrate pride with the help of the downtown Tempe Authority, who is showing their support with special pride flags installed on lampposts along Mill Avenue. Now, therefore, I, Corey Woods, and I know on behalf of the entire city council, Mayor of the City of Tempe, Arizona, do hereby declare June 2023 as Arizona Pride Month in Tempe, Arizona. All right, next up here, really grateful for the opportunity to recognize our community working group members for the proposed general plan 2050. The community working group membership is diverse and we're appointed from the city representing residents, businesses, organizations, zip codes, and character area boundaries right here in Tempe. There have been 15 community working group meetings that have been held since July of 2022. Each attending member has given 225 hours of service in just the meetings alone. Many members have participated and volunteered in other general plan related events and meetings outside of the official working group meetings. Examples include arts in the park, public meetings, um, oh, and also they provided perspectives and inputs from their areas of interest and concern, such as accessibility, veterans affairs, dementia friendly development, our 20 minute city, affordable housing, transit, protection of neighborhoods, shade and municipal services. Members have also provided guidance, advice, input and comments that have of course helped to shape the current general plan 2050 draft. 
So on behalf of the Tempe City Council and our Tempe community, we appreciate your hard work and commitment serving on this very important committee. And with that said, I want to make sure we've got some certificates here because one of the things that we do each and every year is we have a boards and commissions event. This past year was over at the Omni Hotel where we recognize all of the members of our 31 boards and commissions for the city of Tempe. Uh, and this evening, myself and the council wanted to make sure that we properly recognized each of those community working group members who have given, as we talked about before, 225 hours alone when it comes to meetings. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and read off the names of the folks here. Uh, some people weren't able to attend this evening, but we'll make sure that they get their certificate afterwards. So the first person that I have here is Donald Ortiz. Is Donald Ortiz here? Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. For those of you who always ask what the, uh, the middle initial of my name is for, is D, is actually Donald, which is named after my father, so I'm very partial to Mr. Ortiz. <laughs> All right, the next person I have here from the community working group is J.P. Coughlin. Appreciate it. The next community working group member is Janelyn Grenillo. Is Janelyn here? Oh. All right. I know Jana well, so I can make sure to get this to her. Perfect. All right. Jason was just informing me uh, we're going to have a big group photo for the folks who are actually here in person once I'm done with all the certificates. All right. Next up here. We have Logan Tokos. All right. Next up, we have Myrna Baez. Next, we have Nolan Williams. Is Nolan here? No. Nope. All right. I know Nolan very well as well. I can get this to him. Okay, next person is Gail Luna. Okay, the next person I have here is Liliana Cardenas. Next working group member I have is Shane Peterlin. All right. I heard kind of a Shane cheering section at the back of the room over there, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as light as I look, Councilor Bar. <laughs> All right. Oh, are we done? We're not done yet. 
I think I think they're not here. They're not here. Okay, perfect. Let me let me read off the remainder of the names though. So I want to make sure that I recognize them. We have their certificates here that we'll get them later. The remaining community working group members were Ann Till, David Sokolowski, Robert Moore, uh, Sabarwar Prajarov, Sydney Bethel Price, Julie Armstrong. Catherine Schmidt, and I do see one last person here that I know who's on the community working group, and that is Patrick McNamara. <laughs> come on, come on up. You got to come on up. That's okay. All right. Hold on here. Gotta, we're gonna find yours here then. And should be the last one, right? No, it actually was interestingly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No? No? Give me the last one you open. There it is. <laughs> good, good thing you don't run the ASU graduation. <laughs> <laughs> that could not be good. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before you go away, Pat, uh, let's go ahead and bring forward all the members who are actually here this evening from the community working group so we can take a group photo. And council, we can probably get at, we'll get in the back or let them come up front. Yeah. I'll just squeeze in. Um, you can be back here with me. <laughs> I just follow what Dave tells me to do. Jennifer, can you switch to Council, could I get one with just the community working group after one with us? Okay, good. Let's just scoot together just a little bit. There we go. That was nice. All right, perfect. All right, everybody, big smiles. Actually, hang on, Jennifer, scoot that way about two inches. Oh, sorry. There we go. There we go. I can see everybody's face. Ready? One, two, three. And then one more for good measure. One, two, three. Perfect. All right. Council, let's uh, move out of their way and let them. Oh, let them take it. Yep. Oh, no, I'm, 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 going, I'm going too. I'm just going to get that out of the way. I thought I broke the microphone for a second. Oh, no, just one with the measure. Just the measure. Just the measure. Okay. All right. Let's slide in here. There we go. That's good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of the residents who served dutifully on that com on the community working group. Also, as a note, too. Uh, the next steps for the general plan 2050 will be going to the development review commission which is an also another group of all citizens who are going to be taking a look over two public hearings and then the uh, general plan 2050 draft will come to the council for two public meetings in august as well so uh, for any residents who happen to be watching we are still taking input and comments all the way up till the final ratification so if you have additional comments or things that you'd like to see or feedback you'd like to provide council or staff uh, definitely feel free to go to, the, to our website and provide whatever comments you have. With that said, I'm going to then move back. Um, let's see here. Madam City, do you want to do your announcements now or would you like to wait till the end? The end is fine. Thank okay. you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to take a little, uh, another quick point of personal privilege, too, to welcome our new interim city manager, Rosen Chowsky, who's a 30-year employee here at the city of Tempe and was the city's first diversity director, city's first strategic management director, and now is our first <coughs> female city manager ever in the history of Tempe, which has been in existence since 1874. Wow. So uh, a huge accomplishment, Rosa. We're so glad to have you, and congratulations on your new role. Right. So with that said, I'm going to move to item number three, 
And first one is item 3A, which is the City of Tempe marketing plan. And I'm looking at Nikki Ripley and our team from Small Giants that are here as well. All right, hello, Mayor and Council, Nikki Ripley, Communication and Marketing Director for the city. With me tonight is Danielle Ferraletto with Small Giants Marketing Agency. But before we get started, I want to acknowledge a couple of groups that are in the audience. One is the members of the Communication and Marketing Office team. They are so uh, dedicated to the city and good at what they do. Uh, they really engaged on this planning process, and I know they'll be super engaged on the fulfillment of the plan as well. And then secondly, in the audience, we have some of the leadership of the Tempe Tourism Office and the Downtown Tempe Authority. Tempe Chamber couldn't be with us today, but all three of those groups really did support this effort wholeheartedly, and I know they'll be alongside us as we fulfill the plan as well. So without further ado, Danielle Ferraletto is the president of Small Giants Marketing Agency. She uh, and her amazing team uh, were selected by the city and those partner groups to devise the marketing plan you'll see today. So uh, I'll let Danielle present, and then we'll be very happy to take any feedback that you have, field any questions that you have, and brainstorm alongside you if that's what you'd like to do about additional plan elements. Take it away, Danielle. Okay, thank you. I am gonna match the energy of Mayor Woods, so watch out. <laughs> Um, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, first of all, for entrusting us and also allowing us to dig into the deep um, brand identity and the overall look and feel of the city. And also thank you for choosing a local woman-owned um, agency to do this work. We have had such a wonderful time, and we really feel very personally connected to the outcome. So um, it's just going to be great. The agenda that I'd like to cover today is really to just give you a quick, very high level overview of the background and the current situation that kind of drove this, the scope of our work and what we did and how we approached it. And then finally, um, we wanna go through the objectives of the plan, the strategic goals, and at the end, the tagline recommendations as well. So let's start with the why. Why are we here today? And a few of the drivers for that um, really started with you, Mayor and Council, with um, the intent to increase and enhance business recruitment, tourism, and economic development at the highest level, and also partnering with our agency to really um, build on the good work that has already been done with uh, the communications and marketing team. The other thing I think is important to point out about this plan is it's deeply rooted in your strategic initiatives as a group. And um, just to re recap a few of those is safe and secure communities, strong community connections, quality of life, sustainable growth and development, financial stability and vitality. And those were all taken into consideration when we built this uh, plan also. What you asked us to do, was create a comprehensive citywide marketing plan. And that included getting into a measurable result with goals, uh, strategies, and tactics, recommended resources, including staffing plans over time, and then what those roles and structure would look like, and finally a recommendation for the tagline. So how did we approach this? Well, it was basically three pieces. We started with discovery workshops and we got to know each and every one of you as well as wonderful partner groups, including um, tourism, the chamber, and um, the downtown Tempe Authority. And through there, um, we then all came back together. I'll show you that in just a moment. Combined our findings and our information and then made recommendations. We also did work closely with communications and marketing team, and they were really very, very knowledgeable, helpful, inviting, and supportive of the recommendations that we were making. So what does this look like? Just by the numbers, I wanted to point out that it was five months, 13 workshops, and 30 people that participated and uh, worked tirelessly to this endeavor. One of the things I wanted to point out is that we developed basically an ambassador for each one of the partner groups so that they 
came alongside me and heard different elements. So we had two people in each one of these workshops or more. And then, then when we all came together, they each brought their own kind of vested partnership um, advocacy so that we made sure that this was something that could work as a comprehensive plan. The first thing that we asked each and every person was, what are your objectives of the plan? Why, what does success look like for this plan? And it really came down to three key elements. The first one, and I think probably the most important one, was stakeholder alignment. And what that looked like for us was the ability to share resources, to have a shared vision as these different groups, and then have clear objectives that were measurable and people could point to success. Secondly, overall people wanted and desired and supported a much stronger presence for this great city. So um, they wanted more robust and ambitious marketing, more visionary, um, to building on more visionary marketing that um, allowed you to match the vision that you have as a city. And then that came through multi-channel enhancements to build upon the marketing um, activities that currently exist. Finally, we wanted to achieve your goal, which is that all of this would be measurable, measurable and point to economic um, attraction and retention. Through our discovery workshops, we did find a bit of a gap. And so the North Star Report was something that was a huge resource for us. There was a lot of work done and hundreds of pages on that. They interviewed over uh, 1,200 participants. That was seven years ago. And so it was supported by mayor and council to go ahead and look at an identity refresh for the um, city. And it's important to point out that this is not about colors or logos or anything like that. This is about brand identity. This is about an aspirational statement and um, pointing back to the great attributes of the city that you're building on. So we drew upon three things. The first is the past with the North Star Report that um, provided us with comprehensive research. It had relevant aspects that are still very true today. Then we had our own discovery sessions that we drew into this. And then finally, the goal is this identity statement that allowed us to really pull out the differentiators, the things that are not easily replicated within this for the city, and it has an aspirational aspect for it so that we can achieve some of the things that we heard from you, like strategic communications. All of that feedback fell into four major buckets in our view. One is one of the most wonderful things to celebrate and enhance is that you are a university town, highly educated workforce, highly educated residents, forward-thinking people. Secondly, um, it was about just movement and activity and energy. The third is how you treat and attract and retain and, and value your business force. And whether it's a startup or an existing um, business, just the support and the, um, and the overall um, goals, shared vision and goals that you give to those businesses. And then finally, it has to do with community and family, really that someone can find something. That was a very common theme that we heard from everyone, is that there's something to be found no matter what age, no matter who you are, you can find something um, and that that diversity spans into all things, including events and the arts and many things like that. So. Our challenge then was to take the 2016 statement and, and update it into something that was reflective. And the whole purpose of this is so that it would really ignite action and more um, vision and aspiration into our plan. There wouldn't be a gap there. Um, so this is what we came up with. Obviously, we're open to your continued um, feedback. This was the consensus of the group. And the statement is this. An innovative community, youthful in energy, rich in history, and forward thinking. Tempe is the heart of Arizona where art, education, and diversity thrive. So with that being the heart of your identity, we felt that a really good way to approach this plan was from the inside out. So now that we have an identity, we span out. The five spokes that you can see along here basically made us committed to these messages being equally balanced and also 
have frequency and consistency in these messages. So what that meant to us was business retention. That was one of your goals. That was very obvious to us, and even with the stakeholder groups. Um, we also heard quite a bit about very important and equally but different stories with North and South Tempe. And we felt that that needed to live throughout the plan so that those um, great stories live equally. Resident care and compassion, and then the community, be it events and arts and um, the parks and open space. We really wanted a platform to celebrate that as well. And finally, visitor and business attraction. So we designed the plan going forward then so that it had longevity. There were basically three goals. One is longevity. We did not want to put this much work into a plan for all of you and have it only have a shelf life of a year. And so we made, we, we made the goals broad and then the strategies and the tactics specific and measurable. So the longevity of the plan is intended to really be a working document so that it can be built upon. The second piece and second element of that that's important is that it included a staffing plan. Some of the goals are very ambitious, which I think is good, and you're ready for those. Um, the future is very bright for on, on all fronts for this. The staff needs help, and we need some specialization for some of the areas that we're intending to go as well. And then finally, the budget. I am aware that you did support $25,000 per year in order to enhance the different initiatives all that exist in this plan annually, but we also wanted to make sure that the staff was proactive in asking for any additional budgets. So that is in that plan as well. So some of the outcomes that we wanted to focus on is six different elements that you can look forward to in this plan. And the, the remaining time that I have will be to focus on what those goals, strategies, and tactics are. But this is the tangible elements in, um, in general that you could look at, that we want to really point this to be a more experiential city where you can live and breathe the brand and the identity unifying messaging across these different stakeholder groups, and then even have the ability to go into additional stakeholder groups. We want you to compete at a higher level and have impact while enhancing your brand equity. So here are your three strategic goals. And I'll be brief, I'll give you some examples. I could sit and talk about this for two hours, but I'm sure that this is not something that you thrive on for you know that long. So. The strategic goal number one is basically to enhance the departmental and citywide communications overall. And there are many, many different ways that we're gonna to get to that. The second one is to ensure brand consistent consistency and alignment, namely with the messaging and the activities where one group is doing something from a marketing standpoint, sharing those resources so that we're able to combine and be more efficient and have centralized knowledge of who's doing what as well. The third one is to enhance and elevate the city of Tempe's local, regional, and national brand and to achieve a more competitive business recruitment platform. So goal number one, enhance day-to-day -day departmental and citywide communications done through three major objectives. The first one is to improve and increase real-time and direct outbound city to resident um, communication. So a few of the things that we had thought of that you can look forward to is um, a civic engagement platform so that there are different ways to reach them and mo more channels to be able to reach them, not just social media, but other avenues as well. The second um, objective is to enhance and increase visitor engagement through social media. That was spoken of a lot. There is a lot inside of that. And in fact, that initiative alone we'll have a plan that's going to have to be crafted by a communication and marketing team. But just a few teasers to that is having a platform and a software so that they can manage and have consistent um, brand messaging and, um, and have a dedicated area so that they can um, have better planning for that overall. And then one of the things that was asked quite a bit is that council is really an extension of the marketing and the communication of this city. We want to move forward right away with um, the social media training and planning to give you the tools that you need to be able to do that well as well. Objective number three is consistent 
brand messaging and tone. And so this really talks about just rolling out that um, overall messaging, including story spotting, and then hiring someone who is a copywriter specifically to carry this in through all of the different departments. Goal number two, as we talked about, this is about brand identity, messaging, and activities among the different groups into a centralized model. And what that looked like was objective, the single objective we have for now is creating consistent brand identity because this is a very ambitious objective to be able to bring all people together and create a platform that works well. One of the things that we talked about related to this and that you can look forward to is a shared calendar um, of all of the different activities, including different events uh, for the city so that people are aware of that and they're able to share stories and promote those and bring that into your overall brand and your goals. The second one is Team Tempe already exists internally and is alive and well, and we heard really great things about that. This is basically to create a liaison for the management to achieve that. All right, I'm on the home stretch and I have one minute left. Uh, goal number three is enhance and elevate City of Tempe's local, regional, and national brand to achieve competitive business recruitment, tourism, and overall economic development. Two objectives here. One is starting really kind of at the local level is implementing the new brand identity across the messaging internal service providers and external providers. So a few things that we would be looking at from there is basically getting feedback and then uh, measuring reach and engagement. The second piece of that is um, creating brand interaction touch points. So if any of you have been to the airport as an example and have heard the messages from councilwoman or mayor, we'd like to do more things like that where you actually hear the voice of mayor and council and other um, influencers within the city at various touch points of your cho choosing to really amplify what you're up to and integrate you into that plan and the history of the city. Um, also QR codes could be very powerful throughout the city, enhancing and expanding your signage. We're talking specifically about entry points and ex ex exit points within the city as well, and also just any interior graphics where that's able to integrate into some of the initiatives like the Mill Avenue initiatives that you have going on right now. Final thing is on a national level. We really want to be looking at areas where you can compete, whether it be in site selection, uh, conferences, um, in, you know, again, uh, key tourist areas, um, overall marketing and um, presence in some of these competing cities. We heard not only with tourism, but economic development, such cities as Salt Lake City, Denver, Tampa, and Charlotte. Let's talk about the tagline. So the tagline, we were asked what our recommendations were, not to create a new tagline, but through what we heard, we definitely know that the, the existing tagline right now is making waves in the desert. And through our discussions, people felt very comfortable with um, the making waves portion. The in the desert is where I think they got a little bit more stuck. So some of the suggestions we had were to enhance that tagline, keep it short, but build upon it to really bring forward innovation, forward thinking, and have it marry up with your overall new brand identity. Um, and I'm happy to discuss that any further as well if you have any questions. So our last, our um, recommended next steps and final slide is um, upgrade of system software to be able to achieve this in an organized manner. We need the infrastructure. Alongside with the infrastructure, we do have recommendations for staff additions. Over time, it's a rolling plan. And then um, implement your new identity. We're really excited about the aspiration that that conveys and look into some of the more immediate elements of signage. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much for the presentation. Let me first go to Vice Mayor Adams, then Council Member Garland. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned, I have a number of questions actually. So um, you mentioned staffing levels. Uh, what, can you give me numbers on that and, and what that would entail? So, 
Um, it is the more detailed plan is in your packet. I'm happy to discuss anything okay. um, further <laughs> in there. We do have actually. I just want the public to know. Yes, on on um, one of the pages we do have the numbers by year. The vision, I believe, right now is over a three-year period. There's actually. Um, several positions are already approved that will be rolling into this fiscal year. And then next year, I think it's a plan for three and the year before two and then three. Okay, thank you. Um, and did you guys have, I think you did, but did you have residents included in on, on this plan? Or just the chamber? And, I mean, I shouldn't say just the chamber. I love the chamber, but. Uh, the partner groups and their various board members, some of whom are residents, were involved in the discovery sessions. Okay, thank you. And what are our measurement tools? How are we gonna measure that if we're being successful? We've been talking a lot about measurement. I can start and um, there's a lot of measurement to be done of this plan overall and in specific. So Danielle referenced one example is the creation of a social media plan. That needs to happen, and that's our team making that real. So there's a lot about this plan which is meant to be a framework that then we need to go back and really hammer out specific plans for. So the social media plan, as an example, will have measurable goals for increases in things like reach and engagement, um, potentially the use of new tools, those kind of specific measurements within a dedicated plan for a tactic like increasing our social media presence. Because I'm just uncomfortable um, not having specific measurement tools um, laid out in this presentation. As, I mean, we, we're a city that really um, focuses on measurement tools. And so, you know, that, I would like that um, really drilled down and, and so we can have that known to the public how we're going to measure this. Thanks for that feedback. On the granular level with this um, social media plan, that's one measurement that would be to come. On an overall basis, uh, we have performance measure 2.21, which is satisfaction with the availability of city information about um, programs and services. That is an overall existing performance measure where we could take this plan and add to the strategies that are already hammered out to advance that performance measure. These are some of the things we're thinking about already with respect to measurement. Okay, and then uh, entry points, you mentioned entry points. Uh, what are you thinking about um, what that would look like for um, entry signage? So our um, concept and also in working with Nikki on what she's aware of that's already existing and what is planned was just the enhancement, whether it be size or just um, including a little bit more of some of the brand identity within some of the signage, and then monument signage, just to really um, create some wayfinding and landmarking of the city and reinforcing the brand throughout. Okay, I, uh, I know that we have new signs uh, when we come into the city, uh, but I mean, if you look around other cities, they have so much better signs and they're so much bigger and we Better. agree, Vice Mayor. As you know, we replaced and refreshed the 29 entryway signs that were pre-existing at various points within the city. But we've long had the vision of doing a series of monument signs, and I believe that you funded that. You funded the initial design and exploration for that in the first year of the CIP this year. Okay, um, thank you. Go ahead. Vice Mayor, I just want to make sure I was corrected. Um, it, our plan, there's two that have already been, two positions that have already been approved for this year. The fiscal year 24-25, our plan includes four, and then 25-26-1, um, and then 26-27-2. Okay, that's a lot of extra, extra positions. Just, you know, I mean, I'm just being cautious, but that's, that's a lot of different positions, so I'm just concerned, about, obviously, about the budget, because that's what I'm concerned about a lot, so. It's a great point, Vice Mayor, and these represent small giants' recommendations for the ideal staffing to achieve the plan that they've laid out. We will most definitely, as I mentioned, when we get into this as a team and dig in and set up all the ways in which we will need to make this real, there will be evolving thoughts about the help we actually need on the ground, and that's what Danielle was referencing with sort of empowering us to be proactive about asking for those needs every fiscal year throughout the duration of this plan and potentially into the future. Okay, thank you, that ends my questions. You bet. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you, Vice Mayor Adams. Next up, Council Member Garland. 
Hi, thank you. Thanks, thank you for the presentation and the package with all the information in it. It was great. I did um, actually um, print out the page 18 that shows the organizational chart and those positions that we're going to be adding in. Um, I, I like I like the idea of what you presented in there, especially the 2425. Those positions are exactly what we have talked about as a city council about being, you know, the strategic communications manager. That that is something we just talked about recently about how important that position is and having a copywriter and the digital media specialist. Those are really important things. If it, the bigger that we have, are growing as a city, the more that we need to be out in social media and we need to be doing it right and we need to be doing it you know, with the same buzzwords and things like that. So I, I, I think your organizational design is, looks great. Um, uh, turning the page to page 19, the next page, um, I wasn't all that excited about um, because I'm not really, still not excited about the making waves in the desert. Uh, even though on here you have making waves in the city, making waves in the heart of Arizona, and the other ones that you've suggested, I, I think are fine. It's still that making waves. It still doesn't like get me excited, like you know, keep Austin weird. I mean, it's not something that just it, that I could see people wearing on T-shirts and going, oh, I got to get that shirt. I go to Austin and we got to get those shirts. So I'm still not really excited about that one, but I, I appreciate what you're trying to do to try to make it work. Maybe until we look at doing something a little bit different with that. Um, the other one is I'm, I'm not really comfortable about the North Tempe, South Tempe thing. And the reason why is like, where, where do you put that division? Where do you, I was knocking on doors last week or just a few days ago and somebody said, yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you're here in South Tempe. And I said, oh yeah, I said, I'll be somewhere else. Anyway, he said, North Tempe was north of the canal in Tempe, and that's not very far from his house, and that's that's still what I would consider south. Some people say it's the US 60, some people say it's the river bottom. So I think, the thing I don't like about that is it kind of sets us up dividing the community, um, and I, I would rather look at Tempe as a holistic Tempe, although I know that, that there are so, so many parts that are different um, as our character areas, we've got eight of them. Uh, so I know that our, the character of the areas are different. It just seems, it's just hard for me to define what north and south is and how do you get the flavor of those when it's so mixed. But um, I just... That Thank that you. Design. I appreciate those comments. If I may just clarify, on north and south Tempe, it actually, the intent, and we're happy to modify that, it wasn't really to call out north and south, but to make sure that the great... Because ASU and Mill Avenue, and this is just my view, it could take over the news and the message and the marketing every single day, mm -hmm. but there are great stories that are happening in South Tempe. And so we just wanted to put it in there so that it's top of mind reminder as this plan is executed, that there that it pushes us to find the stories that great restaurants, the great events, the great, you know, everything about the whole city. So if there's a better way to approach it, it wasn't anything that's gonna be in writing per se, it's more around execution. Okay, I've just, for me in my head, I'd rather than not see maybe North and South sit on there. Maybe it's something that says, look at the greater Tempe, not, or maybe just says greater Tempe or all of Tempe. I don't, I don't know, but it just, when I saw that, I'm like, oh, I don't really like that division, but I appreciate what you've done though, thank you. Mm -hmm. So thank, a, you. thank you, Councilmember Garland. Really quickly, too, before I go to Councilmember Chin, then Councilmember Keating, um, one of the things I'll need direction on Council before we wrap up today is sort of about the tagline, and I know Councilmember Garland kind of touched on that, so I want to make sure that I go around and get people's assessments so at least uh, staff and the team at Small Giants knows exactly what the direction is when they walk away from the table. So with that, Councilmember Chin. Thank you, Mayor. I want to go back to what uh, Councilmember Garland just pointed out, and I... I, I suspected that that wasn't your intent on the North and South Tempe, but presented that way, I'm a resident that lives in the middle. So you eliminate people and it's not inclusive. And But I didn't think that, I suspected that that wasn't your intent. Um, we need something a little more maybe general or universal or comprehensive, whatever it may be, um, based on what you just shared. Maybe it's the Discover Tempe or, or something, so it's not a geographic division. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Councilmember Chain, Councilmember Keating, the Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I, I actually, I don't mind the making way. I mean, I don't like that, right? It's too long, you know that, I've been talking about it. Um, I just think, I think the slogan should be shorter and more concise. 
I do like making waves. I like desert waves. I think both of those would be, I'd be completely fine with. I mean, it's highlighting our lake, which is the big draw that we have for our city right now. So I am comfortable with that. If there is a more creative option, like Councilmember Garland's talking about out there too, I'm open to that as well. I just wanna say from my perspective, those two would be completely fine with me. I know there's others in there too. I'm not sure I like in the heart of the city or anything like that. Again, it's just too long, right? Just do it, right? You remember that slogan, not a slogan that takes two breaths to say. So um, yeah, I, I like both of those two options. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Councilmember DeVar. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, no, thank you guys for the presentation. I, I know you guys put a lot of work into this and, and I love the fact about the social media part and trying to improve our website and our web page and just making things more friendly. The calendar of events that is more inclusive that one stop shop and people can kind of find out where to go. I think that's huge in my opinion. Um, I get the North and South Tempe. I kind of know that people say I'm in North Tempe or I'm in South Tempe or Central Tempe. Those are probably the three geographic areas in my opinion. But I think that people know that South Tempe is a different buzz and feel than North Tempe. It is. And I, I think you're, I think creatively highlighting that some way, I'm not separating it, but you're highlighting that, that there's difference in, in those two areas, just like in other cities throughout the country, they have a North end, South end, or uh, little China or, you know, wherever districts. Um, I think that you're just highlighting Tempe though, in general, and the characters are different within Tempe in general, just like downtown ASU. Um, so I think that uh, I, I believe we still can play off that somehow, some way. Um, making waves, you know, I like that, just short and simple. I, I call this, you know, often because I, firefighters I work with that are way on the west side, we're, you know, when we're going to Tempe, going to T-Town, very simple, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's very catchy and it's just <laughs> to the point. And, and that's them talking about coming out here, hey, we're going to T-Town, let's go, you know, it's just, that's it. Um, so I think it's that natural stuff that I think I, I like and enjoy and, and um, I'll throw that out there as a consideration. Sounds good. Thank you, Councilor Raj. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I actually like T-Town. That is pretty cool. <laughs> you know, that, that's catchy. I kind of like that a lot. Um, yeah, I was the same way. I don't think making waves is, is us. You know, we are making waves, but we are so much more than that. So I would love something catchy, bitey, that's going to grab people in, like his tea time. Um, and also, I love the idea of having our voice over. When I, I, I travel a lot, and I know the council, I know by their voices which council member is in the airport because I hear it over and over and over again. And I would love that maybe in our library or in our museum or something that people go in. And, the, and when we when they go pay their water bill, they go through the door and, and one of us can say, hey, welcome to the water. This is council member Hodge or this is council member Garden. you know, something. So I like that idea because I think that the more they hear our voices, the more they see our faces, the more they feel more comfortable with us. So I, I, I truly love that idea about that. So that's that's phenomenal. I think a lot of what you said is is great. And I do agree with council member Garland. We are one city and I know that that North and South is gonna always be there, but we need to play in it because it not only does it affect our city, it even comes down to our school districts. North and South schools, this school over here, that's, we need to realize that we're Tempe and how we bring that together is just, it, it really does make a difference because even the kids feel it, even as young as grade school, well, I'm in the North Tempe schools or I'm in this, you know, so, and it's not a good thing sometimes how they talk about it. So I just, um, as much as we can to make this Tempe, you know, because you don't hear people say, oh, this is Mesa. It's always <laughs> Mesa. It's not um, South Mesa, West Mesa, East Mesa, North Mesa. It's just Mesa. So I would just hope that maybe one day we can become just Tempe. That's good. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Councilor Bavar. I thought you were promoting an airport. I'm with you. If you're trying to get an airport here so we can get our names and start talking. <laughs> I know that uh, sports complex used to be an airport. We can just wipe that thing out. <laughs> oh. oh, man. Um, so a couple of things on my end. Um, I really, talking about the tagline, I would like to personally move away from the tagline. Uh, I, I, def I like something else. I 
the, the making way, and I know you, the, the first conversations about this were in 2016, 2017, so it was probably right when I left the council and Council Member Keating came on. So that's why I just don't sort of have the emotional connection to it. But when I think of it, I just don't think of anything. I, I, I think it's supposed to sort of symbolize innovation and youth and being progressive, but it doesn't, it just doesn't land to me. So I would love to go away from that. But I, I like what Council Member Devar is talking about with something and Council Member Keating, something short, something very punchy, something that people can clearly remember, like the Nike slogan that you just quoted. So I would like to move away from that personally. Um, but I like the themes that you were highlighting that you would incorporate into the development of a new tagline. So I'm totally comfortable with what you're using as sort of um, some of the baseline keywords, I guess I would say. Um, the second thing is I, I totally agree with all the sentiment here, too, about the sort of the North Tempe, South Tempe thing. And I understand exactly why you did it. But I'd like to also move away from that too, because I think that, I mean, I, when, as Council Member Hodge was talking, I kept thinking one Tempe is what I kept thinking. It was just sort of this whole concept. I, Because it, 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 it's, it's tough for me. I mean, we all hear it when we go out knocking on doors and go to neighborhood meetings and people will say, well, you know, I'm a North Tempe person and you guys clearly care about South Tempe more than us. And they go to South Tempe and they say, well, you know, you obviously care about North Tempe more than us and we should be annexed into Chandler. And it's like, we care about the entire city. Uh, I mean, there is a council member, like everyone sitting up here, we cover all zip codes in the city of Tempe but from 85281 to 85284. But what I would love to do is to not sort of highlight the North-South Tempe thing, but really kind of stop pushing that as much and really start pushing residents more towards what Councilmember Hodge was talking about. Look, we are one community of 42 square miles, and we need to see ourselves that way, as opposed to thinking that this, com this part of the community gets more than me and, and we feel neglected. I really would like to say we are one Tempe. We're not, we're not North or South. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? So generally speaking, I, I, what I heard consensus on, there were, there were sort of two big points that came up. One was about that North-South Tempe, and I definitely heard some consensus about wanting to try to move away from that as much as possible in whatever the final plan is. Um, I also definitely heard some consensus surrounding uh, going forward with sort of a new tagline that might incorporate some features of what the old one did, but I definitely heard, I, I would hear some, some consensus by council to try to come up with something a little bit different and coming up with something a little shorter, a little catchier, a little punchier, uh, something that you know people can say, in, as, as Council Keating said, in, in one breath. Um, T-Town. T-Town. No, I like, it's kind of it's cool, I like that. Um, and, uh, and, and then the other theme that I heard talked about by a couple of council members too was the whole notion when we talked about uh, personnel and positions was talking about strategic communications. And I do think that that's a very critical thing with all of the things going on in the city currently and all of the things that will happen in the future that we can anticipate are going to take place. I think having someone devoted to that kind of position, really just sort of focusing on, because we kind of look at marketing and strategic communications in sort of two different buckets, but I think if we could find a way to get a position on like that, I think it would really continue to enhance the great work that the team's already doing here, so. Thank you. Mayor, question on the tagline, would you like to see us back at work study with some ideas? Uh, how long do you think it would take? I'm just out of curiosity. We could be ready after your summer break, potentially, with some ideas. Council, do you want to maybe schedule this for the retreat, perhaps? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be great. So we can have a conversation. Okay. Great. Sounds good. All right. Look, more consensus. I love it. Thank you very much. Anything else before? Or? Not for me. No. Good. Council, any other comments or questions? Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Great work. All right, next up, item 3B, City of Tempe Boards and Commissions Engagement Recognition and Diversity Update. I will call upon Madeline McConville to come on up and give us a presentation. Okay, I'm not as tall, so I'm going to lower these bad boys. I have that problem every day. <laughs> okay, perfect. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for letting me provide you an update. My name is Madeline McConville, Council Aid. Um, here to just provide an update on the Boards and Commission's engagement, recognition, and diversity. So a fun fact, in 2022, we had 272 Boards and Commission members, which also included our African-American advisory and our Tardiata. 
Um, they volunteered a total of 4,779 hours, which is an economic impact of $143,131.05. Um, as you also know, you know, the knowledge, guidance, and recommendations from our boards and commissions are not only invaluable to you, but really to the rest of our city. So again, I'm really just here to provide you um, an overview on the work staff has done just to continue re-engaging with our board and commission members to recognize them and to ensure that the diversity of our boards and commission members reflect the city of Tempe. Okay, so this work um, or the project really aligns with performance measure 2.15, feeling invited to participate in city decisions. Um, this aligns with strong community connections. So the project background, um, just again, kind of reiterating the purpose and objective is to you know, improve boarding commission experience and satisfaction while also focusing on the diversity of our boards and commission. So this first was requested by a former council member at the February 20th, 2020 work study session to just have some general information brought to the next work study session. So that's when it started in March, 2020, work study session staff presented on you know, the same type of presentation, engagement, recognition, and diversity. Following that presentation, Tempe City Council had provided recommendations to staff to continue, or to, I guess, to, to re-engage um, with the, um, excuse me, the annual boards and commissions event, issue name tags to members, and then providing that special recognition for members, which we do at those annual events with the name, um, the name tags and then the pins of the five, 10, and 15 year um, years of service. City Council had also directed staff to issue a survey to boarding commission, mem to boarding commission members to really just kind of understand their you know, engagement, satisfaction, that kind of stuff. So then at the August 2020 retreat, the results of the survey, um, the survey that was issued to boarding commission members were presented. And then um, Tempe City Council then asked staff again um, to kind of explore additional options. Um, then September to December 2021, you know, research and input um, was provided by board and commission members, staff liaisons, and then um, the chairs, and then staff had done additional research into um, the items that were discussed at the August 2020 retreat. Um, then staff had presented at the January 2022 work study session on all the work that was done from September to December 2021. Staff had presented nine recommendations to city council at the time that you received unanimous consensus from city council to pursue those recommendations. So getting to where we are now, um, January to May of 2023, staff has really just been working on developing the implementation plan for those nine recommendations. So just a friendly reminder, we have 28 boards and commissions. This does not include our African American Advisory Committee or our Tardiata. There are specifically 14 advisory boards and commissions that advise you on policy or development. Um, and then this 256 number, again, that does not include our African American or our Tardiata Committee. Um, so getting into our implementation. So again, just a reminder, those nine city council recommendations were in three different groups. So recruitment, training and development, and then engagement and appreciation of boarding commission members. Um, you know, since it had been a bit since we had surveyed boarding commission members about a year and a half, we really wanted to re-engage, just make sure that the recommendations still reflected, um, you know, the priorities of our boarding commission members. So we had sent out a survey in April of 2023 to our boarding commission members. The survey was anonymous and we received 72 responses. And then from those responses, 70% of our total 28 boards and commissions were reflected in the survey. So these um, getting into the survey results. So diversity is incredibly important as we've discussed several times before. Um, we worked with our diversity office and our communications office to survey the board and commission members. Again, voluntary, completely anonymous. Um, as you can see, 68% of our board and commission members who responded to the survey are white, and then the other 32% reflect um, multiracial, black, African American, um, American Indian, et cetera. Question, the next, uh, yeah. Is, is, in the, is Latino in incorporated into multiracial? Yeah. Yep, okay. so this is the same type of question. So when board and commission members um, apply to be a, on a board and commission, this is the exact same question that we ask them. So okay. yeah, Latino is technically, if I'm right, um, it's an ethnicity. So like on the census, they ask you if you're Latino or not Latino. Right. Um, and then when you specifically get into races, this is um, a normal question that's asked. Oh, Council for Hodge. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was just, yeah, I was just asking if, if Latino was, I just noticed since that's 
um, I didn't see that broken out in the, so I was just curious, yeah, was to where it was in the, in the wheel. So, so Kara, I don't know if you, or Councilmember Navarro, if you want to explain. Councilmember Navarro? No, this is, and just to this point, this was kind of the thing also with the census that they took out uh, Hispanic, Latin, you know, all those. And okay. when people took the census, they didn't match where they were at. They had no idea that, well, now you're considered Caucasian or this is the category you're at. And not, and not to reflect this, I think that, when we go out with surveys to our public, it's, it, you know, that's the first thing I look at, well, then where do I put? Okay, I got it. You have to know the rules. Um, so the thing is, I, I think that if we do a survey, if we do want something uh, down the road, I think having that you know, in there, I think would yeah. be better. Yeah, and I can work with city clerk's office to kind of, because this is again, the same question that's asked in the application. So we can make sure that that reflects <clears throat> The, the different changes. Sounds good, Bill. Thank you. Yeah. So getting into the age range of survey participants. So as you can see, you know, a large chunk of our members are in that 65 and over, but anywhere from, you know, two to two to 16 percent of um, our the people who responded to the survey um, are in that 18 to 64 age range. Councilman Rikini. <laughs> well, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> so this is a conversation I, I've had years previous, I'm um, going to say it again, you know, the average age of Tempe is, is under 30. I know that's skewed by a lot of college kids, but I, I would just like to see, and I, I don't know what the answer is for this, but <coughs> some sort of thought into put in recruiting young professionals, you know, I would say 25 to like a 40 year old range to, to get them involved. And I see that, you know, the purple is the third biggest slide. So that's, that's kind of right what I'm, where I'm thinking, but you know, we want to make sure that our boards of commissions hold, hold so much weight on the decisions we make. And I just wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure that those that make up our boards of commissions are representative of the population that they're representing. So I'm not asking for an answer now. I'm just putting that out to the ether like I do almost every year that it has gotten better, but let's, let's, keep, let's keep focus on that as well. Yeah. Thank you. If you have any ideas, yeah. you know, Look, yeah. You know what? I'll, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Getting into gender identity. So 52% women, 45% male, and then three in that non-binary or preferred not to say category. Um, so the final question that we had asked, and this mirrors the same question that we had asked in that fall of 2021 survey, is really, again, just to get the, you know, to gauge if the priorities that, you know, the nine recommendations that we had presented to you about a year and a half ago were still reflective of their priority. So they were able to choose the top three ways the city can improve their experience. As you can see, the top four are additional interaction between members and city leadership, council members slash council committees acting as a liaison to a board and commission. I'll get into that specific one later. Additional collaboration between the commissions to achieve citywide goals. And then, um, Finally, training and onboarding of members. Again, these um, responses that we received were pretty reflective of what they were saying in that fall of 2021 survey. Let's see, this question on the previous slide too about the uh, split between men and women. Yeah. You don't have to have the number from where it was like two, three years ago. Because I remember it was, it was definitely very different. So I believe that, you know, kind of since this council's been sworn in, I think, because I remember, I, I might be misquoting the number, but I believe it was like, Roughly 65% male and about 35% female, like probably right around July of 2020 or so. So, I mean, this I think does represent a pretty seismic shift and a lot more balance, but I'm just not sure if we have those numbers right now. Yeah, I think we would. And that specific survey, I don't know if they had surveyed, you know, respondents um, or if that was from the application numbers, but I. We'll have to figure out. We'll have to look back on that data and see if we can get that to you all. Sounds um, good. Well, thank you. Okay, so getting specifically into the implementation plan. So this is broken up by each of the nine recommendations, and then you'll see the status on the right. So starting with um, annual recognition event, again, we've done this for the past two years. We actually set a date for 2024 already of May 17th. That'll continue. Hopefully we don't have another pandemic that pauses them again. Um, the next council member is acting as a liaison to a board and commission based on assigned council committee. You all have seen that plan. You all have approved that plan. It's part of your packet. Um, and then getting into the boarding commissions presenting their annual reports at a council committee. So each of those boarding commission, or yeah, each of those boarding commissions that are assigned to a council committee, that's where they would come and present those annual plans. 
expanding the annual public information campaign that is also in your packet chris baxter and the communication and marketing team they drafted up a public information which also includes a targeted recruitment campaign towards underrepresented communities getting into training and development um, establishing city clerk's office as a central department this has been completed it's been the central department for a few years now um, the next one, instituting a minimum level of training for all members and liaisons that includes equity and action. Still working through this with the city clerk's office. We're hoping that this is finalized in fall of 2023. Next, establishing a mentor mentee program. So instead of forcing boarding commissions to have a mentor mentee program, we're instead going to empower them to continue doing what they're doing. A lot of them have a mentor mentee program. Um, and then finally, empower boards and commissions to refresh and develop for those who don't have them, their bylaws in the next 12 months. Again, um, finalizing this with the clerk's office to develop a template for those bylaws so they are standard through all boards and commissions. Okay, so next steps. Again, just continuing that annual recognition event. Um, next, implementing council committee liaisons and annual reports to be presented at the respective council committee. Continue working with our communications and marketing team on that annual information campaign and targeted recruitment. And then finally, you know, just continuing to work with our city clerk's office on finalizing that minimum level of training, refreshing and developing their bylaws, and then having consistent agendas and minutes, because I know that's another thing that we hear a lot from you all. Um, okay, so then before I take questions, Jason's gonna play a video that was developed um, for specific the outreach and communications um, by our communications and marketing office. I love serving on the Sustainability and Resiliency Commission because I can help deliver a sustainable future for all of Tempe. We're so lucky to have such a beautiful city and uh, being able to participate in that process and work with the city staff who are all incredible human beings who do so much work for the city. It's an opportunity to participate in civic life that I really enjoy. I would definitely recommend serving on a Tempe Border Commission to anyone who is interested in getting more involved in their community. We really need diverse voices on these boards and commissions. Whatever your expertise is, whatever your love is, whatever your desire is, I think you should give back. I think that before you leave this earth, you should serve. And the city of Tempe has all kinds of boards, all kinds of interests. And I'm sure that there is a board that you might be interested in. So I invite you to serve, serve your city. with that, I will take more questions. Sounds good. Thank you for the presentation. Councilor for Garland. Thank you. Thank you for gathering all this information. I just want to also give a shout out to Tim Gomez when uh, he was still here at City Hall. Um, he was kind of helping kind of craft what this boards and commissions was going to look like. So I just want to um, give a shout out to him. I, I was on the Neighborhood Advisory Commission and I approached um, Councilmember QB about us not having name tags. I said, it's absolutely crazy that we go out into the public and people don't know what board of commission we're on and we could be such great ambassadors for the city. So it took her a long time, but she was able to get it. And I was really happy about that. Um, you know, one of the things um, I mentioned uh, when I got on the council, I think it was sworn in July, we had our retreat in August. I was so nervous because I had this list of things that I would love to see different in the, um, on the boards and commissions. And so many of them are reflected here, plus the other suggestions from the other council members. And, and I think you've done a great job in pulling these together. Um, the one thing that, there's still something that kind of troubles me a little bit about this is that, um, not troubles me, but you know, I, I've talked to people who are on boards and they would say something like they were on one border commission and then they termed out, and so they went to another border commission, and then another border commission. I think the five, 10, 15 year pins are really cool, but what that tells me is we're not encouraging um, other people to get on, onto the boards or commissions. And I know that that's kind of hard because you, you get your applications and we have to choose, or the mayor has to choose on the application on what to do with that. But um, I, I just think we need, we gotta find ways to really open up the city um, and get people from all over the community. And I, I, again, I just think that if we are just moving people from one board to another, we're really not um, really impacting the city, I think, like we want to. Um, and then the other thing that I had had talked about, and I think I talked to this to about this a while ago, but um, is the standard minutes. So 
Um, we get our minutes from um, that we are supposed to be reading that we get them from every committee, every board or commission. It's really kind of hard to read the minutes because they're so different. And at one time the city clerk had said, had mentioned to me that they were going to do a new training and so that everybody registered the votes the same way, everybody wrote the same information. Some people write a book on their minutes and some people do bullet points. So um, I would still like, I didn't see this on here, so I'd still kind of like to see if we can find some way to kind of get standard minutes so it's easier. Yeah, that is on our next steps in um, in conjunction with the training, then it'll be, you know, standard bylaws, standard minutes and standard agendas. Oh, that'll so. be great. Okay, thank you. And then I, I think the recognition was a huge hit. I, I can't tell you how many people that were at that event came up and just, they were so thankful that you guys did that. I think that that went a long way in our community for us to be able to stand up there and tell them thank you. Um, and I don't think we say that enough. I also like the, the separation of um, how we're breaking down the, the boards and commissions under each committee. I think that's really healthy because if they want to hear from us and they want to see us besides just at the recognition. They want to see us in their committee. So I think that that's a really great idea. So I just want to say thank you so much. Yeah, it's all you. my notes. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Councilor Hodge. Okay, um, I'm going to go back to Councilor Keaton's suggestion. You, you know, you said give us one. Maybe you we should uh, do recruitments at the university, um, ASU. We have ASU in our back door, so maybe we can go and talk about our commissions and boards and how to get involved. And also, at 18 years old, we have high school kids who are they're registering to vote. They could be registered to do a board of commission if they know about it. So more commu um, more to get that 18 to 24 and at 25 to whatever that is up is to go to them. We got to meet them where they're at, not the other way around. Thank you. Yeah, Sounds good. Thank you. Councilor Brooke Chin. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to piggyback on that one a little bit. And, and I think diversity in, in all respects is important for participation on the boards and commissions. I think what I heard Council Member Keating say, right, was let's make sure we're representative of our community and our residents. And I'm a huge fan of ASU students, but that's not exactly what we're looking for. I would like to see residents that own homes in our area that have that are stakeholders. And we have spots for ASU students on our commission, specifically for ASU students, and that's great. We should continue that where it's appropriate. But I think what we're looking for is those middle categories, right? And I agree. And some of that may be looking at scheduling because mm -hmm. in the middle areas, there are a lot of obligations that perhaps people in those categories have, whether it's with work or family. So we need to look at scheduling and when we um, have meetings, if that's our intention. Council Member Keating? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to clarify one thing that I don't think Council Member Chin was asking for. When you say own home, renters, renters are, okay. Also. Okay, great, I just wanted to clarify that. And obviously what you said about scheduling is, is spot on. When you have a majority of our commissioners, 65 plus, that tells me that they're most likely retired. And the people we're looking for will probably be working. So no, I think, I think you're spot on with that. And obviously like virtual options and things like that could go a long way in helping as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Councilman Navarro? Yeah, no, that was exactly what I was thinking too. She hit it. Um, scheduling would be great. Scheduling even to the point where the items are maybe a little bit more timely, like a 30 minute item or a 20 minute item, or, you know, you might have to do a, a couple of them throughout the month, but I think there's some creative things. I think that also uncoupled with, we need to motivate, we need to actually staff, city, us, recruit people that are in the community to step into those roles also. Um, and just, you know, get more people, social media, whatever it takes to do that. Or we can do work with the judge, we could do mandates, uh, community service, you speed in our town, you're part of the commission. Or if you have uh, military obligations, two years commitment, it's kind of like Germany. But uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> it was taking us so serious. No, I think there's a lot of a lot of ways that we can get volunteers. Thank you, Councilor Navarro. Anyone else for the comments or questions? Can I just 
Yes, of course. Um, and also maybe have like, we hit people at the libraries, at the museums, have tables out telling about the commissions and stuff mm -hmm. in different areas. And like our, when they go in their water bill, just have like different things that to say, want to get involved. This is how we get involved. You know, just out there. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Anyone else? I think everyone covered everything I was going to say as well. So no, I feel very good. But thank you for the presentation. Great information. Thank you. Good job. Good job. All right. Next up, that brings us to item 3C, Capital Improvement Program Quarterly Construction Update. I see Shelly and Julian coming forward. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council, Shelley Seiler, Interim Engineering and Transportation Director, and with me is Julian Driesing, our City Engineer. So the goal of tonight's presentation is really to increase our, your awareness and our residents' awareness and uh, communication on our projects in various, at various levels in the city. Our capital improvement program is large, and we know that our residents and you as council members don't always hear about some of the smaller projects that we have going on. Obviously, we highlight some of those larger projects and you hear from us regularly. So we wanted to, meet, to bring more awareness to the overall program. Um, and to, con to, uh, excuse me, to continue that communication, uh, we do plan to uh, return on a quarterly basis and then highlight different pro uh, projects. So if you as council members are interested in hearing about anything at our ne next quarterly update, please let us know. And I'll turn it over to Julian. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, it's my pleasure to come here today and be able to share with you some of the great programs that uh, we're working on. Here's a, a short list of the uh, different performance measures that are impacted by our capital improvement program. This is not comprehensive. Um, you can see that it touches on really every part of our program from feeling of safety in your neighborhoods through to uh, city infrastructure and assets, our ADA transition plan, um, some of our transit programs, shade, and um, so really uh, our capital improvement program touches upon our, all, our full program. Quickly, uh, just wanted to give an update on Tempe Refresh. This is an in initiative the city's going through where we're really trying to let our residents know about the investment that we're making in the community to refresh and um, improve our capital program. And so there's four main objectives of that program, the first being just to increase that community awareness. Um, let our residents know that we are investing in the community. We're spending millions of dollars every year and um, improving the quality of life for our residents. Also incre increasing the positive feelings. Um, sometimes our, our projects are inconvenient. If we're driving down the road and there's construction, that's inconvenient. But just understanding that in the long run, the, imp the investment uh, will result in a better road, right, for longevity. Um, so just um, understanding that there's um, the inconvenience really is positive in the long run. The third being public participation. Uh, we, I think we do a really excellent job as a city of Tempe. There's always opportunities to improve, but just including uh, our residents in the process. And then finally, uh, many uh, hours are put in by our city of Tempe staff at all levels of the organization and just making sure that, um, that they're being engaged in the process and being recognized. And here's just a few pictures uh, uh, that you might have seen while going, traveling in the city of Tempe. On the left is a uh, refresh uh, in the downtown. The center is a refresh project at one of our parks. And the third is a pavement project that we have in the city. So we're really trying to get uh, that refresh message out to our community. Quick update on our capital improvement program. I don't think this is new to our mayor and council, but I did want to share this with those in the audience and those um, listening. Uh, we have a five-year capital plan. Only the first year is actually adopted, uh, and we call that the, um, the first year constitutes the capital budget. And then the remaining years we use as a guide for planning as we um, move forward with the program. And so, Our current capital five-year program, um, this hasn't been updated, so this is through the end of the fiscal year that's uh, currently ending later this month, but is approximately $1.3 billion in the five-year program. Um, and you can see listed on the screen the different uh, programs. So uh, as small as 600K for solid waste to as much as 325 million 
in our water program and varying sizes in between. And so I did want to point out that uh, we do anticipate a bond election in November 2024 that does impact the five-year program. Here's a highlight of just our 22-23, and you can see on the bottom our capital program this year was uh, just over $461 million. And I did a little bit of research, and just six years ago in fiscal year 16-17, our capital program uh, was just over $143 million. So just in the last six years, our capital program has tripled, more than tripled um, in monetary value. A little bit about our engineering uh, division. So our primary uh, goals as they relate to the capital program are studying, planning, designing, procuring, and then constructing projects. And then along with the team that uh, the teams that do that, we have support services that includes our contract staff, right of way, utility, survey, and GIS. So as Shelley had pointed out, a lot of times we hear about just the larger pro projects, but we really at any given time have many projects and there's actually a full list of the projects in uh, your packet as well as, and that can be re referenced by our uh, residents online. So we have 167 active projects right now. And so they're in varying stages. Um, you can kind of look at the graph on the right, but between study and planning is about 25%, about a quarter of um, our efforts. Uh, in design, we have 44 active projects, which is again about a quarter, and then we have 85 that are in the construction phase, which is about half our project. So again, 167 projects is um, no easy task. We're up to the task. Um, and so, uh, and, and I'll, further in the presentation, you'll see just how comprehensive, how all the different um, parts of the community are touched by our program. Along with those 167 active projects, we have 259 active contracts. So um, many of our projects, especially as you can imagine in the construction phase, we may have third party construction manager, uh, construction materials testing, post design and construction. So um, with those 167 projects, again, 259 active projects active contracts. So now the rest of my presentation, I'm just going to touch upon some of the projects in varying uh, phases. Um, so we have some projects, for example, on this, these next two slides are our recently completed capital projects. And this is, again, not comprehensive. I just uh, picked uh, four of the ones um, that are kind of more high, high profile, but there's definitely other ones. Um, so examples being the Tempe Center for the Roof, or for the Arts, the Roof Rehab Project, our library camp campus uh, landscape improvements, waterline replacement in our neighborhoods, as well as uh, the widening of McClintock Drive. So again, here on the bottom of the screen, this is just some of the photos from our Tempe Center for the Arts Roof Rehab Project that uh, was a significant investment um, to preserve the programming and all the great things that get done in that facility. The next one is the library campus. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance recently to visit there, but this project really turned out nice. You can see in the photos here, it's lush, it's green, um, it's got desert landscaping, and um, really just has improved and refreshed that uh, campus there. And then again, here's just some additional uh, recently completed projects. Again, not comprehensive, uh, but it, it touches upon our playgrounds investments, uh, simple items like fixing our roofs, making sure doing structural repairs, um, water valves, chilled water loop that recently crossed Fifth Street to serve our downtown, um, multi-use paths, ADA improvements, uh, fuel tank replacement. So you can see our, our capital program touches on many, many elements. Next slides are going to just uh, touch upon some that are finishing up. So real excited about the Envision Center Resiliency Hub. Uh, the construction is complete on that, and we're actively working on uh, furnishing that facility. And so I was excited to see that recently um, on a couple news stories um, in the picture here that you can see that in the middle. On the left is how we started that project. You can see the, um, the, the floor was in bad shape. There was wires. Um, a lot of investment went into really creating this facility um, that we have today to be able to activate that and um, serve the members of our community. And then on the right, there's a, a picture of the outside. And then Alameda Streetscape Project. Uh, we're anticipating that project to be completed in August. Um, that runs all the way from 48th Street on the Phoenix border to um, Rural Road. And um, it, it, we've been able to tie it into the uh, ADOT project even to add that continuity, connect those neighborhoods that were 
historically divided by the I-10 freeway. And so some photos here that show the new bike lanes, um, some vegetation that's been added along there to improve shade. And then again, excited to have that um, connection over I-10. Other projects that are um, actively under construction. So uh, we have our Tempe Municipal Operations Center, which we often call TMOC. Um, there, it's divided into two phases, and the first phase is in construction, um, has been for some time, and um, we're closing in on the end of that with construction anticipated to be completed in uh, September of this year. Um, also, Clark Park is another exciting project that we're looking forward to have um, done. That includes uh, park improvements, a uh, recreation center, as well as a new swimming pool in Clark Park with estimated construction completion um, in October of this year. And then if another one that's uh, near here, I think that anybody that works around here has heard the noise, is a city hall deck and HVAC replacement project. Um, that one is sp split up into phases and we're actively working on the HVAC as well as um, the deck will be done, is being done in phases with the first phase under construction now. And um, also uh, just various restroom updates in some of our fire facilities. Now getting into the beginning of construction, um, Fire Station 2 has just kicked off. Um, that construction will uh, last from 2023 through July of 2024. A very exciting project, a very unique project in that we are constructing the new fire station on the same lot as the existing fire station. So um, doing that in phases, working closely to ensure that our um, fire medical rescue can continue to function and serve our community while at the same time providing them a state-of-the-art facility uh, when this is done. And then we also have some water line replacement, North Tempe water line. That one just started construction to be completed next year, as well as um, Diablo Stadium parking lot. We're doing some improvements there. Some spaces were lost as a result of the ADOT widening project, and we're um, restoring those with uh, some additional parking. And then actively in design, I'm not going to go through all these in, uh, just for time's sake, but um, as you look through this, I think that you'll see that um, again, just every part of our community is touched, whether it's, um, you know, pedestrian improvements, um, both in the downtown and in other parts of the community, um, Roosevelt storm drain project, you've heard a lot about, um, we have granulated activated carbon and water treatment plants, pedestrian signals. So just again, these are just a, a small handful of the design projects that our team is actively working on. So at that, um, that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to um, hear any questions, comments, uh, if you're interested in any tours at any time, um, we're happy to accommodate that. And our next planned quarterly update is uh, September 28th. Sounds good. Thank you. Great presentation. Really appreciate it. I have one quick thing, and I'm going to go to Vice Mayor Adams. Um, Julian, is there ever a situation, or Shelly, where there are, there are um, we already have bond authorization or the money to complete the capital improvement projects, but we don't have the staffing to actually finish the, or not finish the projects, but actually kind of go faster. Because sometimes, you know, we'll hear from residents, hey, we would really love to get our streets repaved a lot faster or resurfaced or another project accelerated. So are there times where we absolutely already have the bond authorization, so the money is available on the capital side, but we just don't have enough money in the operating budget to actually go out there and push those projects through faster? Yeah, we're always taking a look at our staff and trying to deliver that program. And, and actually, I want to thank the mayor and council this um, um, operating budget, we were successful in getting another uh, project manager, a uh, civil engineer, that is going to help us to uh, move forward some of those projects. Uh, it seems like more often than not, we're running into just some of the um, issues on the construction side with long lead. Um, and so I think on the design side, we, we, we're doing a pretty good job of, of moving those forward. Um, but, you know, uh, we're constantly taking a look at our, our existing staffing and trying to make sure that um, we're doing the best we can to deliver the projects, but I appreciate that question. Sounds great. Thank you. Vice Mayor Adams? Yes, uh, I'm very excited that we're going to do quarterly reports on this. I just, I really appreciate that. The communications is going to improve greatly. I don't want our residents to be guessing all the time, like, is this going to happen? You know, and to have the reports and, hey, we are um, putting our money where our mouths are and, and we're getting things done. So I'm, I'm super excited about this. Um, of course, the CIPs are very near and dear to my heart uh, since I was involved in the process for many years. Uh, I'm just, I, I, I'm asking a Ken Jones question right now. And uh, Ken was always uh, focused um, during our CIP meetings about the, the percentage of project, projects that were completed. And I'm wondering where, where we are 
um, with the, with our completed projects. Like, are we getting them done in the time frame um, that we're we're um, you know phase one, phase two? Mm -hmm. Are we are we getting them done in the time frame that's being allocated with the CIP money that we we've given? I'm not Councilman or Vice Mayor Adams. Thank you. That's a mm -hmm. um, very good question. Um, we definitely it kind of depends on the funds. Some funds we do we're able to do a better job of spending the dollar amounts. Um, some of the other ones um, we struggle. And and again, it's, it has to do with um, the, the types of projects. And sometimes it's the dollar amounts. So you can imagine if you have a, a ninety million dollar project, you know, project, it's you're getting it's easier to spend uh, the funding authority as opposed to if you have. Uh, a lot, a lot of smaller projects, and so um, it is something that we're tracking. We we have a a, a performance measure of a ninety percent spend on our capital program, and uh, so it's something that we are continuing to track and try um, to meet that. And um, you, you know, it, one of the problems that we run into sometimes is uh, we get to this time of the year where it's July, we get a, a whole bunch of new programs. I just mentioned we already have one hundred and sixty seven active ones, so. It's, Sometimes it's just a matter of trying to finish the ones that we have before we start the new ones. And so um, it's, uh, it's something that we're constantly uh, tracking and um, we're trying to be cognizant of spending the money that, um, that our community has asked us to do. And do, where are we all with the, I know our goal is 90%, but where are we, would you say, with um, our numbers on the projects? I don't know. I'm going to invite uh, Mark Day up to uh, hey, hey, Mark. answer hey, that Mark. one. <laughs> Come on up. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I believe, don't call me on this, but I can uh, definitely get back to you. We're probably around 60 65%. Okay. Could we include that in, in for future uh, presentations, so, just so we know? And, um, and construction costs have gone up what percentage in the last year that you guys don't have? Oh, um, again, it's project. Uh, specific, but I'd say that we're seeing about a 30 to 35 percent increase in construction costs. So, um, we're and we're I think that it's I've gotten some feedback that it's starting to kind of slow down and and become um, more predictable. But it is something that um, that we're we've been dealing with uh, for the last couple of years. And I think that's something that's important for our residents to know also that we are de we are dealing with huge increases in our construction costs. And that has really hampered the budget and the, you know, the progress that you know, we're trying to make. Uh, but it, that's good to hear that yeah. they're maybe leveling out at least. Uh, so that's, that's great news. So like I said, I really, really am excited about these quarterly uh, presentations. And you know, I love the numbers. And uh, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bergarla, then Councilor Hodge. Hi. So the thing that made me most excited about this presentation was to see the Envision Center on there and that it's open. When I first got on council, the, very, the mayor was sharing his um, state of the city address, and we all videotaped something. And I videotaped coming soon Envision Center. And this second year, I got the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got to tape and say almost the exact same thing about the Envision Center coming soon. And I know that that was a lot of, I know the roof was not what we expected it to be, mm -hmm. so that cost a lot more to get fixed. And I just want to say I'm so glad that that's there, not just for being able to say that we've got it done, but just what it's going to give to that community. I, I'm just, that makes me so happy. So I'm so proud about that. Um, I just want to say that it's really, I like the pylons that have the refresh on it because I have walked in downtown and seen those. I'm like, that is such a great idea because people see the pylon, see that it's refreshed, know that we're doing something and we're trying to make the city better for them. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I remember um, council, uh, council member um, Arredondo Savage used to say all the time, we need to tell our own story. And I think, um, I don't know how many people have been to um, the Refresh Tempe page on our website, but you guys are definitely telling the story. Um, and as the council member Hodge, uh, um, Adams was just saying about the getting out and like letting the residents know what we're doing. I love how this page has the Refresh Tempe dashboard where you can click on it and click on what you're interested in and then that goes to the map and you have all that information so we can see where the progress of that is. I, I just, it's amazing. I, I love it. I don't know how many people know that it's there and how many people are looking at it. Um, I, and I don't know if this is um, for you or somebody else, but is there an easier way to be able to access that? So if I type in www.tempe.gov forward slash refresh, nothing comes up. If I do refresh Tempe, 
um, or refresh dash tempe, it comes up um, as another page that I need to click and then it goes into, it'd be great if we could share, all of us could share, you know, go to tempe.gov forward slash refresh and they can see this incredible web page and dashboard that you guys created. Is that just a recommendation? Definitely, we can work thank on you. that with our marketing team for sure. Great, thank you, great job. Thank you, Councilor Hodge. Oh, thank you so much for the presentation. My thing is, I just want to set up tours. So um, can you, um, I'm one of the people who would love to go out and, and look at the different, um, you know, projects that we've done and what we're working on. So, and um, I was going to say the same thing that Kelsey McGarland said about getting into refresh. It is, it is, people are commenting on it. They're really looking at it. So to make it easier, I know, um, I know we do like, things in our water bill, but can we just have like a page that shows refresh and like something we have just created, just finished at that moment that's highlighted in it, in the water bill or something to continue on. But great job, thank you. Can I respond? Oh, Councilor Gold? Just wanted to respond to that. Um, our backstage pass, the next event is going to be a hard hat tour of Clark Park. So well, I will let you know so you and we'll publish <laughs> the date. I will invite you. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Anyone else? Further comments or questions? Great job. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And I think and we're going to stay I think, and Julie, before you, before you go anywhere, <laughs> we're going to move forward to item 3D, which is scooters in the right of way. All right. Thank you again. Um, so the vice mayor had asked us to and had raised some concerns on May 11th regarding the safety and the parking of scooters in the right of way and we're here tonight to provide an update to you on steps we're taking to address those concerns. Um, Julian's gonna go through some of the requirements that we have placed on the scooter companies but we recognize there's also work to be done with the users who park the scooters. So um, we'll also address the next steps that we're moving on with that as well. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, as Shelley pointed out, we're gonna talk a little bit about scooters today and some of the efforts that we're working on to uh, deal with some of the concerns that uh, Vice Mayor Adams brought up. So as far as performance measures, um, the scooters really are part of our 20-minute city, providing access, different um, access options to members of our community to uh, move around the city. And then I also put ADA transition plan into just showing how sometimes some of our performance measures are impacted. So in this case, sometimes the scooters are left and become, we've heard concerns that actually um, they have impacted access uh, to members of our community. So um, trying to make sure that uh, we promote things that um, help with 20 Minute City but don't then just negatively impact some of our other performance measures. So our current licensing guidelines, so um, our license program is actually called Shared Active Transportation Vehicles or SATVs and um, there's different items that fall under that and scooters, electric scooters is um, one of those SATVs. And so the current licensing guidelines were approved by the city council back in January of 2019. And there's a number of requirements um, for a company that wishes to get a license in Tempe, including a completed application that makes sure that they have insurance and there's indemnification um, language in there. Uh, there's a data sharing component. They pay an annual application fee. And then there's a right of way use fee since the scooters are in the right of way um, there's a dollar eighteen, and that goes up each year um, per vehicle per day that's staged in the city of Tempe. We currently have three companies uh, with active SATV licenses. Uh, we have Bird, which you'll see are typically the black silver scooters, um, Boaz bikes, which are the blue scooters, and Spin, which are the orange scooters. Um, up until recently, we also had the red scooters, which was Razor, um, but they recently made the decision to uh, leave the Tempe market. And we are continuing to get uh, other inquiries from other um, vendors that um, may uh, participate in the program. The way our licensing is, uh, we don't have a limited number of scooter companies. It's just if they meet the requirements as listed on the previous slide, then they can get a license to um, work in the city of Tempe. I'm not going to exhaust you with this. Um, there are 12 requirements in the SATV license agreement. They're all in your packet and available to the community. Um, on our website, but just a few main points there, you know, we do require that the operators stage um, the SATVs upright and facing the same direction. Um, they're not, they're supposed to be in groups of no more than 10 and then those groups are supposed to be at least 150 feet apart. 
it says in the agreement specifically in the downtown between on mill between university and rio salado that they're supposed to be staged at or near the bicycle racks um, the operators uh, have to stage um, the vehicles so as not to block or impede pedestrians or impact ada so that's part of the agreement that's supposed to be in place um, and then they're supposed to educate their users on how they're supposed to um, effectively park the scooters and finally each scooter is supposed to be touched at least once in, tw in a 24-hour period to um, pick them up where the users have left them and restage them um, per the requirements so um, when we think about scooters sometimes we you know that they're fun they're a good method for short trips but um, the main problem that we see is that the operators generally do a really good job of staging the scooters. So if you see the picture here on the left, this is how the operators left them um, the last time they touched them in that 24-hour period. But the users often um, leave them wherever they uh, desire, and some do a good job of, of leaving them in the right spot, and some, you can see the picture on the right, uh, were kind of left in uh, disarray. So the question is, how can we try to encourage um, both pictures to look like the picture on the left? And so uh, we, we talked among staff, we looked at what other cities were doing, and um, we're actively implementing a corral system in the downtown. And so um, the locations are being determined right now uh, by our transportation staff. Um, we've determined that these, this is a successful um, uh, program, and that's been shown both in the United States and in other parts of the world. Uh, it's typically done with pavement markings, and then we work with the scooter companies to actually geofence so that um, the users are notified where they can park and there's even a financial incentive typically where the meter will continue to run until they leave um, the scooter in the right uh, location. So um, again, this is something that um, the scooter companies can already do and are doing in other uh, parts of the United States. And so here's some pictures of some um, corrals in Santa Monica, DC, and also in San Diego. And then there's additional planning efforts that are going on outside of um, what I just spoke on the last slide. Uh, we're continuing to work on our transportation demand management, transportation management association, and mobility hubs program, as well as we're actively in a study in partnership with the DTA for a curb management study. And finally, we will soon be kicking off the update to our transportation master plan. And so these are just additional opportunities and planning efforts where we can uh, incorporate our SATVs and uh, have those discussions. So at this point, that concludes uh, our presentation, and I open the floor to any feedback, comments, or questions. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor Adams. Yes, thanks for doing this presentation tonight. I'm, I'm really excited to, um, that you presented this. And um, I was coming in today, and I, I saw like five scooters right in the middle of the uh, sidewalk. So I, I just, you know, the more teeth we can, you know, get into this situation, the better. Uh, so just you know, let us know what you recommend. I love the corrals. Uh, that's that's a great idea, and I love that the meter's going to keep on running. So um, that's I think that's a powerful um, tool to use. And then, is that with all all the three scooter companies in Tempe? <coughs> they're going to keep the meters rolling if they're not in the corrals. Vice Mayor Adams, yes, our our goal is to work with each of the scooter program or each licensed scooter company to uh, geofence the in the downtown. Okay, what's our time frame for this? We're actively working on it right now. Our transportation staff is identifying where those scooter corrals are gonna be, and then we'll be working um, with the scooter companies to do the geofencing, which is a, a fairly simple task. We do we already do some geofencing, just for, for uh, Mayor and Council, um, for places where we don't want them to park. So we've had some uh, parking garages where, um, where the private property didn't want scooters. Actually, Arizona State University um, has implemented that kind of a program. So um, it, that it, it's pretty simple. The hardest part is going to be just going out and marking all the locations. And transportation staff is, is taking that on, and we're moving fo forward with that. We hope to try to get it implemented uh, before ASU comes back in the session. That'd be great. So we could maybe have an update on that in September when you guys come back in September. To, um, to see where we are. Also, is there, isn't there a time frame like, like if the, the if they've been in, in one location for 24 hours, like the scooter company will come and pick them up, like in the trucks? Because I've seen them picking up scooters. Yeah. So is that is it 24 hours or I uh, don't know. Vice Mayor Adams, again, our requirement is that they touch them if, and restage them. So if there was to say 
like 15 scooters that they would be expected to move five of those to another location. So, and again, these have to be recharged. And I think part of their program is picking up the ones where the batteries have um, been used and replacing those with uh, new scooters. I don't know exactly how each company functions. Um, we don't, um, we're not restricted to that, only that they have to, within a 24 hour period, um, touch each one and make sure that the, that the scooters there are in following the license agreement. Well, maybe that's an area that we can step up um, because you know if they're I know there's one scooter that's been out there for two days in the same location okay. so um, maybe that's an area where we could say look you've got to get the scooters 24 hours whatever and put them in the corrals yeah um, we can certainly send reminders to the companies as to what their obligations are for operating in Tempe for sure and that's something we can do regularly to ensure that they really understand you know what they're what they're responsible for. And then I think in conjunction with the corrals, we should be able to get a better handle on the parking situation, so. Okay, and so our goal for time frame is before ASU starts. Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Sounds Appreciate it, good job. Sounds good, thank you. Anyone else on council, any further comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, no, thank you so much, appreciate it. That brings us to item 3E, Mill Avenue and 5th Street, all pedestrian phase update. And I see Kathy Hollow coming up. Uh, is Ellie going to be virtual as well? Okay. She says she's on. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us here. I'm Kathy Hollow, the city traffic engineer. And with me on the, uh, online is Ellie Velosen, a senior civil engineer in the traffic engineering group. Ellie, are you there? I'm here, yes. All right, great. So um, just wanted to give you an update of where we're at with this uh, all pedestrian phase signal. I know you're all aware of it. I know some of you were dancing in the street with it when it first opened, so uh, everybody having a little fun. Um, so, oops. Okay, thank you. So uh, real quickly, uh, this uh, program addresses uh, Council Priority 326, a 20-minute city, and that it encourages people to use other modes of travel. And just the timeline that we've been on, we were asked in February to take a look at this and see, oops. Um, in February, we were asked to take a look at this and see how it could be implemented. Um, we did a little research, some data collection, and we started our pilot project on March 8th. Um, and then the pilot actually ran for a month, March 8th to April 4th. We did some data collection during that time as well. We also had a public survey open during that time. Um, so the actual survey ended on April 4th. We still have the, um, the scramble in place and are kind of presenting here to see uh, what kind of direction we might get tonight. So just real quick, um, the uh, all head phase or scramble as it's sometimes called has been around since the 40s. Started in places like Denver, Kansas City, Vancouver, went to New York City. Um, in the United States, we call them the Ped Scramble or Barnes Dance. Um, they've been tested all around the world. And um, we also ha did a little research at the same time to see what other cities were doing. Some of them have um, uh, criteria for what, how many pedestrians you need before they put them in. Some of them use it just when there's a uh, different kind of geometry at the intersection. Um, so uh, we did a little bit of research and then um, Got some pictures for you so you can see how it's being used in other places. Uh, at this time, oh, so one more thing. The, basically, the pedestrian, the uh, all ped phase is another phase within the cycle. So there's a cycle, like a circle, of when of the time in the signal. And right now, we basically had, we had north, south, and east, west. We had to add uh, or take away from the other ones and add some more time in order to do the all ped phase. And I will let Ellie. Um, take over now and talk a little bit more about what we did and how we did it. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I believe Kathy is going to continue to advance those slides for us. I will. So one of the first things we did was um, collect volumes at the intersection. We collected volumes during the PM and AM peak hours on weekdays, and that was in order to get the highest mix of both volume of uh, both vehicle and pedestrian movements. Um, we had the highest pedestrian crossing we had was in the PM peak hour with 143 pedestrians crossing that west crosswalk. We typically have um, about two thirds of all the crossings take place going north south, crossing Fifth Street, and one third uh, 
going east-west crossing Mill Avenue. Another uh, thing we did before we implemented this was an operational analysis. So we looked at the level of service, which is um, a grade that's given to approaches of an intersection from A to F. The level of service, uh, if we were to implement the all pedestrian phase compared to what it is now, um, we saw in the AM peak hour that although, you know, level of service did degrade on each approach, it never reached level of service F. In the PM peak hour, if we were to keep the 110 second cycle that we were using, we would have the southbound approach degrade to an F. So we increased that cycle length to 130 seconds. Um, we did also look at the delay for pedestrians. There is an additional wait time for pedestrians with an all pedestrian phase, just because they have to wait until the all pedestrian phase comes up before they can start moving. Um, there is a slight increase in pedestrian delay. The highest of that was um, in the PM peak hour, from the about 47 and a half seconds per pedestrian to about 61 and a half seconds per pedestrian. So when this all pedestrian phase was implemented, one of uh, the most visible things we did was the signage. We had a uh, very large 24 by 36 signs, two on each, on each corner, and they included a QR code um, that took people to the survey that we, um, put up on the website so that they could tell us how they felt. We learned that these signs uh, did start to disappear pretty quickly and they continue to disappear pretty quickly. Um, so we've continued to replace those. We've gone to a, a smaller format and one on each corner um, to try and keep that efficient. We also put in no turn on red signs um, because a way all pedestrian phase is most beneficial is to make sure that there are no cars turning when there's a pedestrian movement happening. So all turn on red or no turn on red signs are on uh, construction tripods on each corner and also overhead on the mast arms facing each direction of travel. Our uh, transportation maintenance crew or signal technicians did uh, really jumped in and, and took care of the wiring and the cabinets to make this work. Uh, our pedestrian clearance times were increased to 34 seconds to allow enough time for um, every member of our community to cross diagonally if they so choose. And the cycle length, as uh, mentioned, was increased in the PM peak hour from 110 to 130. And during all off peaks and weekends, we were running a 94 second cycle, which doesn't fit all of the all the movements. So all of um, the rest of the time, it increases to 110. Um, and in order to, as best as possible, maintain the progression along Mill Avenue, we also increased the cycle lengths and adjusted the offsets um, along at 7th, 6th, 4th, and 3rd. So we know there are some current challenges to the way it is, um, the way the intersection works today. Most of these we could address with some structural changes if we decide to keep the all pedestrian phasing. Um, so some of those are first that the intersection is on pedestrian recall. So all of the intersections along this corridor of Mill Avenue are on pedestrian recall. And that just means that we don't require people to push a button. They are going to get a pedestrian walk signal on every cycle. Um, and that's to be more pedestrian friendly. But because we don't have button activation, we are giving the all pedestrian phase in every single cycle, even when there's no pedestrians present, which could potentially cause motorists to be um, frustrated when they see there's no one using the signal. Um, another is the presence of streetcar. We uh, just have to make sure that any signal timing adjustments we make um, maintain the progression for the northbound streetcar and maintain the cycle length needed and the, um, the green time needed for the streetcar to go through and clear the intersection. And then finally, accommodations for the ADA community. We don't currently have high visibility crosswalks striped in the diagonal, um, which is something that if we decide to keep this permanent, we will definitely move forward with. Also, if uh, someone using a wheelchair or any wheeled device decides to cross diagonal, they will have to cross the streetcar tracks at an angle, which we know can be a challenge. So during the implementation, we did quite a bit of, um, of data analysis to see what, how it was operating. The first is the queue lengths. Um, you can see kind of the, the feet of the queue that we observed at the highest, um, highest queue observations there. But in general, on the east and west side, 
the queue spilled back to the Maple and City Hall crosswalks, respectively. And then in the northbound direction, the queue was reaching about halfway between 9th and 10th Streets. And in the southbound direction, um, about to that second Hayden Ferry building right before the bridge. So we did see traffic backing up through University and through Rio Salado. Um, we did notice a bit of a challenge with compliance. We did some preliminary observations of compliance for all modes of travel that are using that intersection. And we did see some non-compliance for all modes of travel, some right turning on red from vehicles, pedestrians crossing outside of the crosswalk or outside of the pedestrian phase. Um, and this indicates that if we decide to keep this pedestrian phase permanently, we need to uh, move forward with some additional communication. Uh, about how this should work and the best ways to keep everybody safe at this intersection. We looked into travel time. Uh, we were able to use the RITIS software, so that uses connected cell phone data. Um, so we were able to get some pretty uh, high fidelity travel times in the area. So you can see on the top, that's the northbound direction. And we're showing weekdays here, but we have the same data for weekends and it's very similar. Um, in the northbound direction, we saw an increase in travel time by about 60 seconds between the times of about noon to uh, 10 p.m. In the southbound direction, we see that same increase, but for a longer portion of the day from about 8 a.m. until the end of the day. We believe that the um, slightly better function in the AM peak during, or I'm sorry, in the northbound direction during certain times of day is because of the transit signal priority that we give to the streetcar. Um, because streetcar operates with vehicles, the vehicles are also getting that benefit if they're in line with the streetcar or anywhere near it. Um, we also asked our uh, stakeholders to give us some feedback on how they thought the intersection was working. So we received some feedback from Valley Metro that they did notice uh, traffic tended to back up through 5th Street, which made it a little bit difficult for the streetcar vehicles to make it through the, uh, through the light at times that they normally would have made it through. We also heard from our Tempe Police Department that um, they see some more close calls between pedestrians and vehicles that they notice some confusion in the way, uh, way that's operating, the way people are using the intersection. Um, that at nighttime, it does make the time management of pedestrian safety a little bit more difficult, but they also noted that some changes uh, with permanent signing and permanent striping could potentially reduce some of this confusion and enhance the compliance. Uh, some more stakeholder input we got, we um, were able to talk, DTA helped us out with talking to some of the businesses along Mill Avenue, and you can see there are some mixed mixed feelings. Some of the businesses said they it really backs up traffic. Some of them said they really loved it. Um, the Transportation Commission uh, had a meeting on um, at the beginning of this month, and they actually recommended they would like to recommend to council to extend the pilot by six months. Um, that motion from them passed with seven yeses, four noes, and two abstaining. And we also, sorry, we also asked the um, the mayor's committee on disability concerns to provide some feedback. The um, the individual members, not as a committee, but some of the individual members did let us know that they are not opposed to it, but they would like to see, they had some concerns. They'd like to see some changes made if we decide to make it permanent, which is a theme we're hearing um, from a lot of our stakeholders. So to take a look at the survey that we did for public feedback, we had 149 total responses. We asked people as a pedestrian, do you like it? And as a driver, do you like it? So um, if you look at all survey responses, about 60% uh, of people who are using it as pedestrians say they do like this option. If you look at people who are using it as drivers, it's close to a 50-50 split. They do or don't like it. And we do have it broken out there by different um, different populations within the city. Um, we also looked particularly at the users who report that they use this intersection every day. Um, and so if you look at those responses, we had about 55% who use it every day as a pedestrian say they do like it. Uh, and about 25% of those who use it every day as a driver said they do like it. In addition to asking, do you like it? We also asked, what would you prefer? So those are on the bottom. 
Um, people who said they would prefer the all pedestrian phase are in the bright orange and the people who wanted to go back to standard phasing are in that light blue color. So if you look at the responses from all pedestrians, um, a more than 50%, slightly more than 50% said that they would like to keep the all pedestrian phase. And again, same story. If you look at those who use it on a daily basis, um, more than 50% said they would like to revert back to standard phasing. So I'll hand it back to Kathy for this okay. part. So just to wrap up here, we uh, feel like there's three options for us right now. One is to make the all ped phase permanent. Um, the second is to revert back to what we had before. Or the third is to continue with um, up the pilot uh, for an additional six months before we make any permanent changes. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Let me go to Council Member Keaton and Council Member Barr. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, this is something that I that I'd ask that we we take a look at. However long ago it was, I guess more than six months, right? Um, but I am concerned with PD's feedback. You know, public safety has to be what we're focused on, and I. The last thing we need is an accident or something like that. You know that, that someone ends up with an injury because of this because maybe they're confused or as they even said that they're seeing people not comply with how it's supposed to work. I, I, don't, I don't know if continuing it as is for six months makes any sense because it, is behavior gonna change oh over that six months? Why? Like, I, I just don't see it. I, th I think I would have to say my preference would be to revert back to standard phasing. Uh, I would be open to some sort of plan to make it safer. If we can make it safer, I'm not too concerned about the delays in traffic and things like that, and that's to be expected. Um, but if we can, if we can come up with some way to make it safer to the pedestrians and, and to the, the folks in cars, I could be swayed in that in that direction. But for now, I'm going to say my, my first pick is two, and my tentative second pick is one. Mayor, thank okay. you. Thank Sounds you. good. Uh, Councilor Navarro, is there a pick where certain times of the day it can be? this and that <laughs> <laughs> you know actually we have kind of talked about that if we could do something different in the evening and that would we would have to have the push buttons in order to be able to do that and so that would become part of the permanent installation if we did that yeah i was just and I think, uh, go, go ahead Ellen. sorry i was gonna say i think what we as a department talked about was if that were the case we would have difficulty explaining to the public when they can cross diagonal and when they can't yeah, yeah. We it's wouldn't want anyone to make that mistake and, and get hurt, either, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Oh. No, I've seen it. Um, in fact, I've seen it in, in my daughter's uh, college area at Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois, small town, but yet that intersection where the school and the city kind of meet, kind of like here, uh, they have it. And it works very well, especially when I, on high traffic days. I know that at night, probably more so here, on Mill, that's probably a convenience for a lot of pedestrians. I know that during the Monday through maybe Thursday to five, that's where it's not mm -hmm. um, such a convenience. That's why I was kind of, is there a blend that maybe could happen, you know, from Thursday till Sunday, it turns into this. But if it's a confusion thing, I could totally see that too. I know everyone's kind of giving me a little different look right over here <laughs> off my eye. <laughs> So, <laughs> well, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go really quickly. I think, and I've got Councilmember Chen and Vice Mayor Adams. So, um, my, so interestingly for me, my strong preference would actually be number one, but I'm willing to do number three. I understand wanting to do the pilot more, and I do, I do completely recognize and appreciate the feedback from the commission on this. Um, you know, I mean, I live right downtown. I mean, I live directly one block west. So I'm probably the person on council who is the closest to this. And I do use the intersection every day uh, on foot and driving. And I think the biggest issue with it right now is because it's in this sort of pilot test phase, you don't have the street markings and things of that nature. So people don't exactly know how to use it. And when I see people many times crossing north and south right around 5th, uh, um, like where the Starbucks is, going down to 6th Street by where the post office is, 
I don't think people are deliberately trying to violate the traffic laws. I think it's that they feel like maybe there's something broken with the light because it's taking a lot longer than it normally would. So even though it's still red, they're like, well, hey, I just need to go ahead and go because apparently the light's not working. And I think that's only because there's not the markings there on the ground and then the signage at eye level that says, no, this is deliberate. And you only get to cross at the point that the walk symbol comes on. But I don't think it's because people are deliberately trying to violate it or they don't understand it or can't. I just think they're unaware. And that delay is causing them to think that there's just something wrong with the signal. So they just need to go ahead and go. But I completely understand to Council Member Keating's point why that would be concerning to the police department in terms of just general public safety and traffic safety. But I do think if this is done in a more permanent way where you've got the signage and you've got the markings, I actually think it's a very safe option, it's more efficient, and it is consistent with our goal to be a 20-minute city. Uh, and obviously this has been done in a lot of other cities throughout the entire country in much bigger cities than Tempe, and it's been done very safely and been done effectively. So I think if this is implemented on a more permanent basis, I have no doubt that this could be efficient and effective and also extremely safe. So, but I will say for me, just because I want to go with the commission recommendation, although we would have to probably do from my perspective, uh, so I, I'm going to vote for number three, but I think we would need to do it with something, whether it's temporary signage that's larger and more visible or pavement markings, because I would agree with Councilman Burkitig about this. If we do number three and it's just the same way that we've already done it, I don't see how the data is going to look any different in six months. I think it's got to be something where it's a lot more clear about exactly what we're doing at that corner and what we expect pedestrians and drivers to do. So, but with that, I will go ahead and say I will put my hat in for three. Uh, let me go to Council Member Chin, then Vice Mayor Adams. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Council Member Navarro. Um, so, my initial thought was. I was looking and trying to find if there were some stated objectives outlined for this experiment, and I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. So my objectives for this, and I think it aligns with Council Member Keating's observations and feedback, safety first, right? We're looking for safety. And this was new for everyone. And people have a hard time with new things, mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. think I'm inclined to give it six more months, but we have to add, after what we've learned in this first couple of months, how do we test it differently moving forward? I think you have to somehow add the pedestrian recall because if motorists see that there's no, there are no pedestrians, but the pedestrians get an extended green light, that's frustrating. And it seems broken in a way. Um, also, I just think it takes some education. Uh, to Council Member Keating's point, I noted the police feedback, and I, and I wonder how much of that is attributable to being new, brand new for people, new experience. Mm -hmm. Overall, looking at how this is done broadly in, in very busy cities with high density, and they do it successfully, I'd like to give it another six months, but with some improvements. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Let me go to Vice Mayor Adams and Councilor Duar. Yes, I'll be, I'll okay. be brief. I just... Um, the police feedback is very important to me. I mean, our taking care of our residents and um, safety is uh, not the number one concern. And uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna vote for number two. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Council Member Navarro, then Council Member Hodge. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. No, I, I kind of feel what's been said here. I, I think that it is an educational thing. I do agree with the safety thing. I know that the areas I've seen it at, it works. Everyone knows it. It's it. It's like the streetcar. I didn't know we can drive behind it. It works, <laughs> so I do. <laughs> but um, it's just that it's just that time of thing. Um, so I think yes, with the probably link to three, a little more bolstering of hey, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. You know, it, I think to be honest, with you, the big thing, if we had painted side, if if the lines were painted, mm -hmm. it's really indicating it's an all. 
crosswalk. It really, I mean, when you come up to it, you just really don't know besides the signs and they're, they're kind of, you know, if you're not really looking for them, you're, you're going to miss them. If you're in your own world, you're going to miss them. Um, so I, I, you know, I hate to say it, but I don't know how you can get the paint back up off the bricks, but anyways, stickers. <laughs> they do have tape, but we'll yeah. see. I, yeah. I, I don't know how it sticks to the bricks. The other thing too is if this is something we invest in, whatever that investment is to make it a little more safer for that pilot, my other thought is, is there other intersections that might be able to do the same thing so we're not losing the value of those tested equipment? Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so that's something mm -hmm. to look at. Yeah, we haven't really looked at other intersections yet. We're kind of waiting to see how this one went over with everybody. So. Sounds good. Thank you. Councilmember Hodge and Councilmember Garland. Um, I, I feel the same. I think that we should, uh, I think the safety is very important to me too, but I think we can do it. I, I really, I mean, you haven't seen Councilmember Garland and Councilmember <laughs> Chin when we walked across like the monkeys. Okay, so. <laughs> No one saw that, but it was cool. I did see it. Um, but I honestly believe that it with 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 the right markings, the right safety, I think we can. It is it is done, and I've seen it in other cities mm -hmm. being done. I think it's just new, and I think that the more we continue and have the markings, I think that we can continue it. So I'll, I'll go with three, two. Okay, thank you, Councilor Garland. I say the same thing. Safety is important to us. I think we can do this. Um, I think it's just people learning. I, 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 um, I will admit, I walk to Starbucks quite a lot when I'm here during the week. Um, and I, st I still get a little bit confused or a little nervous. It's like I look up, as soon as I see like the 34, I know that I can go um, and go directly across the Starbucks. So I think that, you know, better marking some other sign, something to make it a little bit more, uh, like it stands out a little bit more to everybody, I think that would be great. Um, so I, I would go for the um, number three, but with, you know, any other recommendations we can get from our um, police for department also. Okay. Sounds good. Well, it sounds like the consensus is to go forward with uh, option number three, that we'll continue the pilot for an additional six months, however, with um, kind of increased uh, signage and pavement markings to really clearly delineate exactly what we're trying to accomplish at that intersection. So we're doing more education and people know exactly uh, what's happening there with the barn stance, which I'd never heard before. So I appreciate, <laughs> Kathy, you taught me something new this evening, so. <laughs> Barnes. Thank you. Henry Barnes, started by Henry Kelsey Barnes. Barnes. <laughs> and if you need someone to do a video, the three oh, of us yeah, are yeah, willing I, I to come and do a video. Yeah, I caught that video. Was, and, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and we'll have to great. rename it the Hodge <laughs> Dance. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mayor. Council Thank members. you, Kathy. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. All right. Next item on the agenda is called the audience for Committee of the Whole Items. There are no items ready for City Council direction or status update this evening, so I'll close that item and move to the next, which is item 5B, Council Committees in Progress, updates as needed. Uh, are there any Council updates on items 5B1, 5B2, or 5B3? Committees? Committees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for us. Oh, you have one? Oh, I just want well, Councilman Navarro? It's a request, though. Oh, um, well, actually, then in that case, then then I'll be the next one then. I guess we'll move on then to uh, future agenda items. Council members may request that an agenda item be added to a future issue review session. In accordance with the open meeting law, there should be no discussion on the item other than to clarify the request. Brings us to item number six, future agenda items. Council Member Navarro. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, two things I'm, I would like to look at, and it might be something that might morph into our committee first before uh, an issue review or uh, work study our issue review, but it would be um, compliance checks. I know that recently we, we talked about and, and voted on uh, 21 and older on tobacco, but the compliance of us doing that um, is, a, is somewhat hindrance of who would do it, who would proceed with it. So I'm thinking we have other issues out there with liquor license, tobacco, massage, uh, whatever it is, whatever industry that we do not um, have real compliance checks something to look at, how that would be staffed, how that um, would be orchestrated, uh, what would the roles be and who would be part of those roles, and then how would it affect um, the budget to staff it or not affect the budget. But I think that we could probably take a little look on that. Okay. That's one thing. Um, the second thing <clears throat> is uh, when we talk about our development, we're talking about um, putting EV stations in, electric vehicle stations within high rise. So one of the concerns um, that we're finding out on the fire side is we're having some 
uh, electrical car fires, and we've had them in parking garages. So it's it's the placement of those EV stations on where the, probably the most pro appropriate places would be. Um, maybe just kind of a talking with uh, um, prevention and planning um, of, of best practices, have fire there, um, because there's some tactical strategies, I think, that might need to be mitigated um, to make those things a better success. Uh, but I think that we don't have the code for it, and maybe that's something to explore, um, probably through our committee um, also, and then we can bring it back to the uh, group. Sounds good. Madam City Manager, sound good? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Anyone else on council? Any other future agenda items? Okay. Next up, then, item number seven, announcements from the mayor and or city manager. I did my announcements earlier, so Madam City Manager, your turn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, am, I have the honor of my first meeting sitting here to introduce uh, your new sustainability and resilience resilience director Eric Iverson <laughs> Eric has served our city uh, in the transit area for 28 years he no one is more when we were talking about branding I was I was thinking I have the honor of introducing Eric as, as a new director in, in this role but he is the brand of Tempe, right? As a public servant, as a diehard Tempe resident, and uh, he became quickly the face of light rail and streetcar. I think he holds the record of presentations to council. I think I counted 52 about a few years ago, just on one project. So when I think about Eric projects and people, um, he gets things done and he has this tremendous care for the community our regional partners and businesses. So congratulations, Eric. Wonderful. That is all, Mayor. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that brings us to item number eight, adjournment. The next regular scheduled work study session is August 3rd, 2023. Uh, this is our last meeting for quite some time, Council, until we come back for an RCM in late July. So for everybody watching, please enjoy your summer. We'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you.